Maria, I'm so excited to talk to you today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to talk to you today. <laughs> it's going to be a great conversation. Um, so, you know, this podcast is really uh, about and tends to feature people that have made choices in their lives to remove things that were no longer serving them, to kind of reclaim themselves, to reinvent their lives, and to evolve. And it's it's really a choice. And for you... Um, I think it's very similar, although your choices were kind of guided by a really big and major crisis. Um, and so today, I would love to hear about what happened and how you navigated it, all the choices you had to make, um, and like the Maria Ross today versus the Maria Ross before the crisis. And um, I think people can really benefit from hearing how you navigated this. Yeah, Maria Ross 2.0. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, like you said, Kristen, it definitely wasn't a choice. Um, it was 2008, and I had just moved to a new city, bought uh, with my husband of almost two years at the time. We bought our first house. We adopted a dog, getting used to a new city, new friends, new network, um, and then as if that wasn't all enough, in the first few months that we were there, um, I started my own consultancy. So I started a new business and things were crazy, like as you would imagine, right? Mm -hmm. Just everything. I was, and I was trying to do everything. And then, oh, by the way, I was also trying to pursue my side passion of acting and voiceover <laughs> and like, I was just all in, right? And I was a healthy 35 year old at the time. And um, after some a very sudden incident um, at a theater audition, actually. Um, I experienced about a month and a half of very severe headaches, vomiting, mm -hmm. like migraines like I'd never had before. And I went to the doctor and the doctor was like, I think it's just all the stress that you're under. So he was like, mm. let's put you on blood pressure medication. And I was like, well, can we wait to figure out some other options? And so I was doing yoga and I was, um, you know, trying to clear my schedule a little bit, but there was just all this stuff going on and not, you know, in the end, this is not what led to it, but I ended up having a near fatal brain aneurysm rupture. So Ooh. all of those symptoms were about, for most people, it's sort of like symptom die. But for me, it was like symptom slow degradation. I, I was very lucky. And um, the day that it happened, I was supposed to go work at a client site um, at Microsoft in Seattle and I couldn't make it. I called in sick. and. Um, was throwing up, I had back and neck pain, like all this kind of stuff. And my husband who was working at Microsoft at the time decided to come home from work early. And luckily he was there because I collapsed on my bathroom floor from the actual rupture. Mm. So they got me to the hospital right away. Um, the brain ninjas saved my life. And, um, but it was one of those things where, okay, you've had this catastrophic thing that um, the statistics say like, about 50% of people don't make it to the hospital. My surgeon said, given your condition, like it was, it's more like 80%. You shouldn't have survived, right? So um, I, I got through it, but it was sort of like, what does that mean for your life? Like I was in an induced coma for a few days and then I was in the hospital for six weeks and had to do various rehabs and things like that. But it was sort of like, what is the quality of your life gonna be like now? Like you don't know are you going to be able to be who you were? What was the extent of brain damage, if any? And I like fast forward, because spoiler alert, I'm here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was one of those things where I was very fortunate that I got the right therapies and strategies post brain injury to be able to sort of adapt and rebuild. And that's always the thing they say about brain injury is like, you're not all better right? Mm -hmm. Like you're fundamentally changed and you have to find new strategies to deal with things. I had a lot of executive functions that got impacted. So uh, my cognitive deficits were things that I relied on for my work, like mm -hmm. problem solving and um, the ability to absorb a lot of information at one time. And uh, I had some short-term memory problems. I had some vocabulary recall. Um, I talk really fast right now, but at that time I wasn't talking like myself. And um, so I had to learn strategies to overcome that. And that was the, the wonderful gift of the therapies was like showing you strategies to deal with what they call the new you. And that's what I 
you know, after this experience, I became a patient advocate. I did a lot of speaking, but I also wrote a book called Rebooting My Brain. And that was the big thing I was trying to get across is that you, you are a different person and you have to adapt to being a different person. And that, that really like curbed my progress in the beginning because I was like, but I used to be able to do this. I used to be able to do that. And finally I had a very great tough love therapist that was like, forget about it. Like, this is where you are now. So deal with what's in front of you now and learn strategies to adapt. And that's exactly what I did. I want to pause for a minute because, you know, we're very deathy on this podcast. We love, <laughs> we love the death. And, yes. Um, I, so my stepdad, um, uh, had an aneurysm and died, uh, a handful of years ago. And, uh, that was one of the catalysts for my getting into end of life doula work because mm -hmm. he was a truck driver. He was in, a, um, an unfamiliar place when it happened with strangers who mm -hmm. ended up getting him to the hospital. And it was way too late at that point, as you, you know, mentioned earlier with the statistic and my mom and I had to fly into this unfamiliar place in unfamiliar hospital with people we didn't know who didn't know how to handle us. And we didn't know how to handle what we were looking at. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the reasons I got into that work was just thinking there must be a better way to do this. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, when you looked at your own mortality, what, what was that like? Like pausing for a minute on... Um, the recovery and and all of that, which we'll come back to, but what was it like sitting with your own mortality? I think that's the big myth of kind of near fatal experiences is that that was the thing that people were hitting me with, like within a month or two of coming home, which was mm -hmm. like, what are you, you know, what are you going to do now? Are you going to travel the world? Are you going to like rethink your career. And I'm like, I just, I'm trying to walk around the block at this yeah. point. Like I was in it. Right. And so I was just trying to survive. I was trying to like adapt. Like, I just want to walk my dog. Like, that's what I want right now. And I, there was no time to be reflective. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't until I, I ended up writing the book two years later, mm -hmm. because that was when I was in a place after I had gotten my my life together, I had gotten my business going again, where I could be reflective and then seriously be like, wow, I, I dodged a bullet. Like, that's crazy. And for me, well, two things. One is for the people around you, it's, it's that situation right away. Like for my husband who remembers every gory detail, and I don't because I didn't, I don't remember the month of August, 2008. <laughs> he remembers everything, right? He mm -hmm. remembers finding me. He remembers the ambulance. He remembers the surgery. So for him, it was a very like jarring, like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I don't know if I've just lost my wife, like blah, 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 blah. But for me, it was like, I woke up and I was like, yeah, of course we're going on our Spain vacation in seven weeks. And the doctors are like, no, like <laughs> you're not. Um, but I think it took, it took time for that to catch up after you sort of get back into the rhythm of your life again. And then you can go, oh, wow. And for me, the biggest, I think writing the book was very cathartic for one, because I got to talk to doctors. and But number two, I realized that the, the reaction of other people impacts your view on your mortality, meaning that the, the outpouring of love and support and just people I heard from that I hadn't heard from in years, like coworkers, um, I, you, I, it was kind of like I got to attend my own funeral, but I didn't have to be dead. And that was what impacted me the most was like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is what I mean to people, or this is the impact that I had on their lives. And it was almost too overwhelming mm -hmm. for me. And so um, I think that that's just an important thing to remember when people face these crises that they're not in that reflective mode right away. <laughs> yeah. They're just trying to get back to basics. They're just trying to get back to basics. Exactly. And for me, my basics were altered. I had to adapt to different things. I had to work in a different way. I had to redefine my identity in certain ways. Um, and I had to reclaim my identity in certain ways because of what I quote unquote lost yeah, so let's talk about that because I think um, it's really interesting what you mentioned a minute ago too about how you kept coming back to at first, you know, this idea of 
um, well, this is who I am and mm -hmm. this is, or this is who I used to be. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that and navigating, you know, hitting your head against the wall, so to speak, um, with that for a while before finally, you know, breaking through and understanding, okay, I'm going to have to do this a different way. Yeah. And I, I can be really candid about this. And the funny thing, not the funny, but the interesting thing is since then, my work as a patient advisor, and I'm very involved with um, here in the Bay Area, there's a brain injury recovery center called the Schurig Center for Brain Injury Recovery. They do post-acute care for brain injury patients, which often is neglected. They sort of like sew people up and send them home and everyone's like, oh, you should be fine now, right? So um, they deal with this every day of how to help people adapt to their new normal and understand who they are now in the context of what has happened to them. So for me, that that looked like letting go of some of the markers of my identity that weren't really who I was, right? I'm good with names. I'm a brilliant multitasker. I'm, you know, all of these things that are in the end are not who you are. They're just behaviors that you show. They're things that you do. And it took, first of all, it took that really tough love therapist I was working with to say, you just got to stop. Like that was the thing was like, I don't need therapy because I'm fine because I'm not a person that needs therapy. Right? Mm -hmm. No, I was a person who needed therapies. I needed physical therapy. I needed occupational therapy. I needed speech therapy. Like, so it was, it was letting go of those things in order to move forward. That was the thing that I learned is that you can keep fighting this and staying where you are, or you can learn to adapt and move forward. Mm -hmm. And that's what I chose to do because I was like, okay, this isn't smart, like to just keep trying to get back to the baseline of what I had. This I had to accept the new version and say, okay, now how do I get to my goals? Mm -hmm. Now how do I do I accomplish these things? And once that internal blockade was crashed, crushed, whatever, um, my my rehabilitation soared. Mm -hmm. So I think it's this thing of um, people want you to be back to who you are after a crisis. You want to be back to who you were after a crisis. Any crisis, whether it's a brain injury or divorce or the death of a family member, it changes you and you need to accept that things are different now. Yeah. And I don't know why as humans, I don't know if it's we're so lost and we, we so want to cling to things that we're like, we don't want to accept that. but no matter what, things are going to be different from that day on. Well, that's kind of what I wanted to come back to is the, the how around that, because I think that's the question. And, and sometimes I get comments and such about, but how do you do that? And mm -hmm. when I think back to my own choices and decisions, you know, I just got to the point where I was tired of my own bullshit and I wanted a different direction. It was as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. Same. I think it's very similar. I, number one, it was and maybe just because like I'm someone who loves learning and loves school, but it's, mm -hmm. it's learning about what's happening to you. Mm -hmm. Like that is the biggest thing that you can do. And unfortunately, the piece that's missing for so many people that go through brain injury, for example, because their insurance might not cover therapies, it might not cover like the education of what's happening to you. So I spent like the first few weeks out of the hospital spinning about why why couldn't I get up and complete a simple task? Why was I depressed? And then I, late, later I found out, I educated myself that these are normal effects of a brain injury, depression, um, anger management, um, like all of these things that, and just knowing that that was what I was experiencing was a huge help to starting that, to catalyzing that change. So I think educating yourself on what is happening to you and learning about the experiences of others. The second thing is getting help. Like that was the thing is I was too proud to ask for help. So yes, I did some of the therapies, but like I said, the, the group therapies they recommended, I was like, oh, do I really need to do that? Like I'm doing really great. There's like a project I want to start. And they were like, mm, we think you should do this. And it turned out it was good for me because there was there were so many other missing pieces. So not being afraid to ask for help was a huge way to reclaim my identity because I realized that's actually a sign of strength. Oh, Going back absolutely. to what we were talking about before, like if you want to find a way to solve a problem in a new way, 
why sit there and like you said, bang your head against the wall, get mm -hmm. help, be smart about it. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So I started looking at it that way. And so, yeah, bring, bring the occupational therapist back for a few more weeks so I can get back to work. Um, let me read up on these things. Do I need to see a therapist? Maybe I do. Like, um, that was another, that was another turning point to adapting to what was going on. So I would say educating yourself, asking for help. And the biggest thing was patience. Cause I am not a patient person. Me neither. And, and I wanted to be okay. The minute I got out of the hospital and it was like, you don't have any appreciation for what just happened to you. Like I was acting like I had had the flu and they were letting me go. Like, <laughs> right. and so once I was like, you know, this is the big thing I talk about in my book is that patience is not stagnation. Mm. It's taking slow, steady steps in the direction you want to go. And eventually you'll get there, but it doesn't yeah. have to go from zero to 60 overnight. For me, patience always was a bad word. Like mm -hmm. it meant, I, it meant I wasn't taking enough initiative. It meant I wasn't moving fast enough. It meant I didn't want it bad enough. But patience is actually really smart because some things take time. And so once I sort of accepted patience as a, not as a detriment, but as an asset, again, that's when recovery got more consistent. It got better. I was able to focus. I wasn't constantly fighting myself. You know, darn our culture and, you know, the, the hustle nature of it, because mm -hmm. that really plays into this a lot. I think at least it does for me and my, mm -hmm. my own lack of patience or recovering perfectionism mm -hmm. um, and that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm part of that group too. <laughs> um, but I think, I think you're right. Like, I love to think of patience now as chopping wood and carrying water time. Like, or just rest time. Like there are a lot of ways to allow a process and something to unfold. You don't always have to be doing something. You don't always have to force it. Like that's the thing is if you're, if you're taking slow steps and, and you're looking at, I talk about this with my brand clients. This is the funny thing of like all these correlations with my, my brand strategy clients is like, it, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to happen overnight. As long as you're taking um, slow, steady steps and the upward and the, the trajectory is going up, that's progress. Mm -hmm. Like that's success. It doesn't have to go from like down here to up here right away. It can right. just be like, oh yeah, we're going in the right direction. Like it's, it's all good. We'll get there at some point, you know? So, um, I just think that's so important to sort of reclaiming your identity. And I would add the other big lesson to adapting is to find the humor in it. I love that one. Um, we, you know, even when I was in the hospital, even when I was in the ICU, like my friends and family true to form were like, you know, they found a little bit of black humor in the whole, <laughs> the whole situation. And, um, you know, my husband and I would sort of joke about stuff when I, when I got home about like, you know, I was like, you have to treat me carefully now. I'm a delicate flower. Like, don't <laughs> argue with me. Or, you know, he would say something and he'd be like, are you having another brain aneurysm? Like <laughs> being able to just joke and lighten the mood and, and lower your stress level and your blood pressure. Like people sometimes go, well, that's an inappropriate way to react to something that's serious or a crisis, but whatever gets you through is okay. Like, as yes. long as you're not hurting anybody, right? So I even like when when I look at things that go wrong in my business or whatever, it's about finding the humor in the situation so that you sort of like take that, it's like taking a breath mm -hmm. and then you're like, okay, now what do we have to do? Like, how do we need to get through this? So I think kind of related to what you're saying about that, that hustle culture mm -hmm. of like, no, I have to be totally serious and make this happen or no one's going to take me seriously. It's like, lighten up. Just yeah. a little, just a little. Yeah. Well, because that, that kind of lightening up and that humor is a form of play and play is probably the most underrated thing in our society. And it's something that I'm personally working on now. I can very, very easily go into that super serious mode. And so sometimes I really like throwing in that mildly inappropriate comment to totally. just keep everybody like, this is not, it doesn't have to be that serious. We can have yeah. fun. And yeah. And, and, and sometimes people, you know, especially back then when I was recovering, like probably in the year or two after, and I would say something, I had some vision issues as a result of my brain injury as well that have gone away. But, um, 
you know, they were, they would sort of get taken aback. Like they didn't, it's sort of like someone who has cancer joking about cancer. Like they didn't quite know what to say or, you know, or someone would say something and be like, oh my God, I, I have such a headache. My head's going to explode. And I'll be like, mm-hmm. yeah, it might. And they would be like, <laughs> oh, did I say something wrong? And I'm like, you know, so it's, it's, I, I just think it's more productive to adaptation and resilience if you can find the humor. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned earlier um, some of the things that weren't really you that you had to let go of, probably really attached to ego and how you judged yourself um, in your profession and in your life. But were there things that you had to let go of that were actually real parts of you that you had to reimagine or evolve? I think the only things that, and by the way, you know, many of these cognitive deficits, this was like 12 years ago. I still, I still struggle. They still sort of pop up unexpectedly, but I've, I've gotten so good at coping strategies. I kind of forget they're still there. Mm. Um, so, but a few things that, that bug me, I guess you could say, are the thing about, I used to be really good with names, mm. like ridiculous good with names. Like I could meet someone once and remember their name, remember their face. And that, that skill had like went away. Mm. And and that's more of like, for me, that was more of like, I was able to make connections that way. And, but, you know, I adapted to that. And now I'm very, not that I go like, I have a brain injury. I can't remember your name, but you know, I'm very like, just, I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Mm-hmm. Like I've forgotten. And now people can joke, the older we get, we can joke about it and they can just think it's age related. But right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was that one. And then the other one is that um, every now and then one of, one of the things that happened to me cognitively is that like my filters got damaged a little bit in terms of like absorbing and processing complex information, which Mm -hmm. again, I'm a consultant, like that's, and I found ways around that. I do a lot more writing things down. I leave a lot more space in my calendar and my schedule for things. Not today, but (laughs) normally, (laughs) Um, but uh, I always prided myself on my intelligence and my ability. And so every now and then, we might be watching a t- my husband and I might be watching a TV show or a movie where the plot's very complex. And I have to ask him to stop and be like, I lost the thread. What, mm-hmm. What's happening? And that, it's not the end of the world. There's lots of people that live their lives like that, but it was something I, I've always been very sharp and I've always been, that's been me, right? And so that's very humbling to just every now and then I have to be like, I don't quite understand what's happening here. And he has mm-hmm. to like, pause it and be like, wait, what? Da, da, da. and I'm like, oh, okay, now I understand. So um, that, I mean, those are the only things really, I mean, other than I've already adapted like the way I work and how I choose to connect with people is a lot more authentic and focused on, on quality mm-hmm. versus before I was so focused on quantity, mm-hmm. like just churning stuff out. Mm. So now I'm like, okay, I, I can't work with that many clients at one time, but damn, every client gets like an amazing experience because yeah. it's, it's a much more quality effort than me trying to like juggle six different clients at one time. Yeah. So anybody that needs brand strategy help, Maria <laughs> is your person. You will get amazing service. Well, and you know, what's funny. People said like, it, it, you know, whenever something happens to you like this in your life in a crisis, people said like, oh, are you going to tell people in business? Like you're very open about talking about your experience. Don't you think that's going to hurt your business? And I, and it actually bringing that personal story into my business immediately increased the quality of people coming to me because they were like, I like her. She's got moxie. Like she's a survivor. I'm going to work with her, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Because you're putting your authentic self into the world and attracting that back instead of some mechanized version of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would, you know, that was a risk of, and, and behind the scenes, I worked with, like, we talk about asking for help. I, I often partner with people and, and they knew about my situation and everything. And I would just rely on them a little bit more. Like, Mm -hmm let's debrief after this meeting and make sure I didn't miss anything key from what happened or so, um, you know, you just, you just re reimagine your life to adapt instead mm-hmm. of like whining about why it's different now and sitting there and going, why me? Cause that to me, the why me question is so pointless because mm-hmm. why not you? Like, it's kind of selfish. Like, why not you? Like yes. it's better for somebody else, but not for you. Right. So, um, <laughs> It's just, it's just so unproductive to be like, why me? It's like, why not you? Now, now what are you going to do about it? (laughs) 
I think that's the point. It could be any of us at any time with anything. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why it's so important to be very clear on what you want out of life, how, who you want to surround yourself with, how you want to go after that. Um, because it could be over at any second. Completely. And I think also, you know, luckily I did get a second chance. And so my sort of, and we hear these stories all the time and we get really moved by the inspiration that people give in their TED talk or whatever. And then we go back to living our life, right? Right. So if I can save people the pain of a brain aneurysm, it's build your community now because you're going to need them in times of crisis. So treasure people treasure your networks, your work relationships, your personal relationships, build a community around you because at some point you're going to need them. And, and also this idea of living, living the life you want to live now because you may not get the second chance. And everyone says that who has these kind of experiences, but that could be as simple as like, you just should get a new job or you should, you know, you don't have to go like, trek through Nepal for six months. Like that's not what that means. <laughs> Ask for that raise. Ask or for that raise. Put that boundary up, whatever it is. Totally. Don't, don't be afraid. The worst somebody can do is say no. Yeah. Like that's the worst that can happen when you, when you think big and you, you ask big. And so like, why wait? Cause right. you, you won't get this. I, I told, I remember telling my brother this shortly after all this happened. And I said, life's not a dress rehearsal. Like we get, unless you believe in reincarnation, we get one chance, we get one go, like, so do it, write the book, like pursue the acting career, go be an artist, change jobs, like change careers, go back to school, like start the podcast, get married, start the yeah. podcast, whatever. Like there's no, there's never a right time for anything. And I think that's one of the imp most important lessons. I'm sure you're teaching that with this podcast, of course, but also with the work that you do. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, trying for sure. I, I think too, if I could add on to that list as a death doula, the other thing I would say is please get comfortable thinking about your eventual demise in enough, in enough ways to put some paperwork together to ensure yes. that you have conversations with your loved ones about what it is that you want that people know where the finances are and where all the files are and um, all the things that make up this very human life that we take for granted knowing that if we end up leaving suddenly tomorrow, other people are left with. The biggest gift that you can give to your loved ones is to make sure that they know what your wishes are and where and what all the things are. So shortly after this experience, we did all that. We created a will, we did you know, health directives, power of attorney, all that kind of stuff. If I could be a cautionary tale for your listeners, yes. is get life insurance. Yes. So here's the deal. I was, it was on my list to go get life insurance as a self-employed person, not attached to an employer, right before my aneurysm hit. And I didn't. And then after you have a brain aneurysm, so shockingly, your rates are sky high and you're in this crazy category. So I ended up finally getting a policy. And then I had later health issues because I, I wanted to switch the policy to a different type and of course put that off. So I still didn't learn my lesson. Then I had other health issues and now I am stuck with this policy that is okay. It's mediocre. Mm -hmm. And I, no health insurance company will give me life insurance. Like none. I do CrossFit. I'm a mom. I run around. I own my own business. I'm like the healthiest, not healthy person you've ever <laughs> seen. And because of those decisions of not, of thinking I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next week. I'm screwed. I could have gotten my life insurance when I was 35 and healthy and not like a lick of issue in my health history. And I could be paying 30 bucks a month for like, $100,000, $200,000 in coverage. Mm -hmm. And I'm not. And so if I can just share that, like today, tomorrow, go get your life insurance. Your family will thank you. You will thank yourself. Like, just do it. Yeah. Thank you. I know, <laughs> I know it's hard. I know it's daunting to think about. Mm -hmm. We're not given any structure in this culture for thinking about those things, but there are a lot of resources out there. A quick, uh, quick 
um, trip to grandfather Google will give you all the information that you need. So just do it. Yeah. Just put it on your calendar and do it. And, um, you know, to your point about, I mean, so many times I've heard those horror stories of people whose family members have passed away and just left a mess behind because they didn't know where the paperwork was. They didn't know where the the pins to the ATM were. They didn't know what bank accounts existed, where there were stocks. If there was a life insurance policy, nobody knew who it was through or what the number was. So yeah, just being able to put that together is so such a blessing for people in a time when they're already stressed and hurting. And like, do you really want to put that on them? to deal with that as well. Because they deal really with paperwork. can't deal with well, it very well at that point. They're sitting in a ton of grief and it's, it's almost impossible. I, I don't know if you have any perspective on this in the experiences that you've had, but something interesting happened when my, my mother passed away a few years ago. She had been in a long decline of congenital heart failure and some other health issues. And in her final time in the hospital, um, she a lot of the the issues that she had were she, she was also sort of early onset dementia she's in her mid 80s and um she had this um very lucid conversation with my brother while she was in the hospital and for some reason he didn't know what why she was telling him this but she was telling him where the checkbooks were mm-hmm. and the thing where the safety deposit box were and like oh here's where the passports are and he was sort of like why are you telling me all this and she died the next day mm-hmm. Like, and mm-hmm. she was actually doing okay. She died from sepsis and they ended up having to take her off life support. But mm. it was this weird moment of clarity that what a gift to my brother that he had this, like he, he even, te- I remember him texting us, like, I had the greatest conversation with mom just now. It was like, she, she was like her old self again and da, 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 da. But then weirdly, she started telling me where all this stuff was and da, 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 da. And thank God, because my dad had no clue. My mother took care of all of the finances. And so I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that, where people have that moment of clarity before something permanent happens. Yeah, actually that it it usually happens like that, where it's right before they die. And it could be around, you know, a number of subjects. It could be a very clear, you know, I love you or other statement um, like that. It could be directions for where things are. Um, it's really interesting. It's almost like at that point, you know, their intuition is guiding them and they have this overwhelming urge to share whatever it is that's going to be meaningful to the person in front of them in that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's really beautiful. It happened, um, with my stepmom too, uh, about a week before she died, uh, I went over to see her and she, she said, you know, we need to clean out my drawers. We need to clean some things out. Um, now, Also, we knew that it was pretty close. And right after we started cleaning things out, she said, oh, no, you're going to want to save all the lingerie. I'm going to need that. And I was thinking, I don't know you're going to need that. But uh, so it can reverse itself very quickly. Yeah. But yeah, it is it is a common thing. And I'm so glad that your brother had that moment I'm with her. I'm so thrilled. And that's the thing, I think, too, that what you're doing with this podcast is don't wait for that. Yeah. Like embrace that attitude before. And I mean, I was, I've always been a very emotive person, but especially since my, my crisis, it's like, I'm going to tell people how I feel about them. I'm going to, if you haven't heard from me in months and you randomly get an email or a text, that's just like, I just want you to know how much you mean to me. Like people freak out when you do that. They're like, what's going on? You know, but I, I do it. I don't, I don't censor myself mm-hmm. to do it. Cause I'm like, if not now, when? Yeah, I did right? that today. I, I told somebody today how important they are to me. And mm-hmm. um, I had no... Uh, I had, I guess I had a little fear about that vulnerability, but not like I would have in the past. And, right. and I think that's a major theme here today as well as vulnerability, whether it's asking for help or telling people what you need or telling people how you feel. Uh, it is a constant theme on this podcast and in life that is the true connector of us all. And we're so afraid of showing our soft underbelly. If we could just get the fuck over ourselves, how much better would it be? <laughs> well, and that's where we all find empathy with each other. Like, is like, oh, you're, you're dealing with stuff too. Like mm-hmm. you're not this, this person on high that has no emotions or has no struggles or it's like, oh, we're, we're like, we're humans. We both mm-hmm. like want the same things for ourselves, for our families, for our kids. Like, so, um, yeah, it, it, 
that was another big thing coming out of this is that I have been more comfortable with vulnerability as a so, result. So comfortable, in fact, that you've written a book called The Empathy Edge. So <laughs> a wonderful segue to two branding Thank people you. having a conversation. Uh, no. <laughs> um, why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, what it is that you're doing now and how you kind of centered um, more into that um, heart-centered kind of leadership space. Yeah. So um, it started with this health crisis, quite honestly. And that's, I opened the book with that story of the, my hospital experience and how amazing it was. And it was my first indoctrination to the fact that an organization could be empathetic at scale. And it didn't mean hiring a bunch of really nice people. It meant <laughs> creating a culture and policies and practices and values that like get into every nook and cranny and inform every decision. And so um, that's why I became a patient advisor at that hospital, because that's how they make those policies is they hear from former patients. Like, what was this like for you? What was the experience? How was the discharge process? Was it really confusing? Was it a really long time? What? And then they make policy decisions based on the feedback they get, which is pure empathy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was this weird thing I started hearing in, with a lot of my brand clients, especially when I work with tech companies, you'd get these like left brain, super logical, whatever executives in the room. And they'd be like, we want our brand to be seen as empathetic. It started happening more and more. And I was mm -hmm. like, really? And then I would sort of be like, are you though? <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, but um, it's just this interesting trend that's happened. And then obviously COVID has accelerated this discussion on empathy in business, which I hate that it took a pandemic, but Ugh. I love that people are actually like, no, this is a strength. Like the companies and the brands that show empathy right now are going to win mm -hmm. and they're going to come through this crisis. Talk about coming through crisis because of that adaptation. It's kind of all the same things because they're able to be resilient and adapt and be human and be vulnerable. Those companies are going to succeed. And so I embarked on a three-year journey of researching all the data and the research to say, is there proof that empathy is good for the bottom line? And it turns out, yes, there is. Hmm. So um the more we can shine a light on those models, the more that will be the norm in business. And my sneaky goal, Kristen, was, and I've told you this, is I actually am trying to make the world more empathetic by Ooh. starting at work. Yeah. So if we have to like speak to people's selfish motives to get them to embrace empathy, then I'm down with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm done with that too. I mean, yeah. we spend how, what percent of our time working? So why would right. we not start there, right? Right. And why, why do we not use the place where we spend the bulk of our time as our laboratory for practicing empathy, as our gym for yeah. working out our empathy muscle? Because I don't know why people think somehow you can be this horrible person at work. And then when you leave work, you like lament the fact that people in the world are not as empathetic as they used to be. Like... <laughs> You know? So I love the other day, you know, Michelle Obama talked about empathy in her speech and the fact that there's this dire need for it in leadership and it's leadership across the board. Like anyone who is interacting with people, we need to, we need to celebrate that as a strength because you can be competitive and empathetic. You can be compassionate and ambitious. They're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, it's one of the things I love about my day job and where I, where I'm at is the leadership. There is a ton of empathy, and it extends, you know, through the organization and outward to customers yes. and partners. And it's really beautiful to be a part of that. Um, right. And I'm you know really proud to be there. But uh, I've been places where that's not true, and it just feels like and it's a void. You, it's like dying a slow death. Like it you're is. just like your, your soul is being crushed. Like we've all, it's funny, every talk I do, I'm like, how many of you have ever worked in a toxic work environment? And of course, like everybody raises their hand, right? But you never, you can't be your best self when you're in that kind of an environment. And I think if anything, my experience that we've talked about today gave me the, the bravery and the boldness to be more vocal about that. Mm. And I, I don't know if people give me a pass because they're like, well, she did survive a near-death experience. Like, let's listen to what she has to say. But <laughs> this, this idea of like bringing that to my work, I'm not afraid to do that. I used to be afraid of bringing vulnerability and compassion and whatever to my work and trying to guide my clients to do the same for mm -hmm. 
themselves internally and their customers, I'm not afraid anymore because like we talked about before, what do you have to lose? Like it mm -hmm. could all end tomorrow. So the worst they can say is like, no, we're not, we're not interested in working with you. I'm like, that's fine. <laughs> We're not interested in being empathetic. We're I know. Go ahead and, and not really. <laughs> We're going to keep not being empathetic with our customers. Like no one will ever admit that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm. I'm not afraid of that either. And I love knowing you and um, you. you know, chatting about this for sure. I, Thank you. Before we go, I want to make sure that people can find you. So tell yes. people all the places where they can find you. All the places. So my main hub is red-slice.com. Red Slice is my brand consultancy, but they'll find my blog. They can sign up for my email list. They can find a, a freebie guide on the five ways that empathy benefits business. Um, and then I'm on the socials on Instagram. I'm on Red Slice Maria. That's my, my business slash personal page um facebook it's slash red slice twitter it's red slice um and i'm on linkedin maria j ross awesome and you know rebooting your brain and the empathy edge yes you must They're both on amazon yes get um them. <laughs> get them. thank you um yeah no they uh the empathy book's really resonating with people right now and i i i swear i did not plan the pandemic to happen <laughs> That would As have been really stunt. <laughs> non empathetic. Of that you. would have been really non empathetic. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it's so hard when people go like, Oh, you must be so happy that everyone's talking about it. I'm like, well, not quite like, but it's good that we are, but I'm not, you know, I wish it didn't take this to accelerate that conversation. But, you know, just like your show is all about, sometimes it takes crisis to push us to be the best version of ourselves and maybe, Maybe that's what we're experiencing right now. Oh, let's hope so. Amen to that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is a great conversation. <laughs>